welcome everybody to a uh, Airminers event on market research. So um, also, by the way, must be said, um, may the fourth be with you. Happy Star Wars Day. And uh, we're convening today so that we can talk through some really interesting over, uh, overviews of the market for carbon removal technologies from the perspective of catalysts, corporations, uh, practitioners, and other, um, and, and other interested parties based on research that the Circular Carbon Network achieved uh, through Anjali, who's gonna be presenting today, as well as Nicholas Eisenberger and Kevin Beal, also of Circular Carbon Network. Um, the way this is gonna work is we're gonna do something we don't typically do, which is have a, a slide presentation for about 30, 35 minutes, and then uh, Q and A uh, for, from you all to answer for Anjali, Nicholas, and Kevin to answer questions about the, uh, about the research that's gonna be presented. I'll come on at the tail end with a couple of announcements, including our next event in two weeks time. And then uh, at the top of the hour, we'll stop the recording and then go into our uh, networking session for maybe you know, 30, 30 minutes afterwards for people who wanna stick around, get to know each other a little bit better, not just know of each other. So with that, thank you for coming and Anjali, take it away. I'm actually going to, uh, Nicholas is going to kick us off here, actually. Oh, fair, fair enough. Go ahead. Terrific. Well, thanks, Jason. Thanks, Anjali. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. It's uh, great to see so many uh, new uh, and old friends um, in this important discussion. I wanted to just uh, uh, give a little context for the Circular Carbon Network and our effort here that Anjali uh, leads. Um, and um, I co-founded the Circular Carbon Network starting in uh, 2017 with the XPRIZE Foundation, which was an outgrowth of an effort that I undertook to raise about $100 million for the Carbon XPRIZE, which you may have heard of, uh, which was uh, uh, awarded last year and was focused on driving new innovation around carbon capture and utilization. We kicked off that uh, effort, if it's hard to believe, in late 2011, and it took some time to aggregate that capital from a group of global corporations and governments. And we set up two test centers, one in Alberta, Canada, and one in Wyoming uh, for carbon capture and utilization um, uh, you know, demo projects, which are uh, exist today and are, are just really helping to feed that ecosystem. And then we set up the prize. Um, but along the way, it became clear as I went around the world really talking to people about this opportunity to have this global competition to drive innovation in this space that there were a number of, a broad number of uh, innovators working on the effort, but they weren't connected at all. Um, and there were many different types of organizations, large and small uh, in the field. And that if we connected them more effectively that we could move the state of the art more quickly. So that was the, the you know, sort of the core insight behind the Circular Carbon Network and our, uh, where we thought we could add the most value um, was not in the policy dimension, it wasn't necessarily in the, in the deep technical dimension, but really building on our understanding and work, uh, my personally, but also the group of, of, of folks at XPRIZE and um, other um, uh, individuals involved in the effort of standing up the Secure Carbon Network, we had real deep expertise in, in, in investment, in the capital ecosystem and in the commercial ecosystem. And we thought that where we will, you know, a gap that we could help plug is how do we get the flow of capital to increase as rapidly as possible to fund these great solutions, to get them out in the marketplace, to start building sustainable, viable businesses that are tackling climate change. So that's sort of the, the essence behind the Circular Carbon Network. Um, if you want to go to the next, next slide. Thanks so much. So what is circular carbon? Um, there's a lot of different uh, terminology out there in our space and it, it just continues on, right? So just you know, five years ago, very few people would have even talked about CDR or carbon removal. Um, so we use uh, circular carbon uh, as an umbrella term that encompasses what, where we really started, which was in carbon tech, you know, carbon capture, carbon utilization, technology driven solutions. Um, uh, as an outgrowth of the uh, Carbon X Prize, um, uh, but also now you know the world has recognized and we've all recognized and X Prize has a new prize as you know the Carbon Removal X Prize, 
that's, that goes beyond just carbon tech. It embraces the biological solutions and the, ge um, the ocean solutions and the geological solutions that we all need to be able to address climate change, to remove the, the CO2 from the atmosphere and reduce the atmospheric concentration. And the way we look at it is uh, we're focused on solutions that physically touch in some way. And Gret, you see that wooden bowl right there? I'm sorry, I was hearing some back. Okay, so could you please mute yourselves if you're not a presenter speaking? Thank you. My apologies. So that some, in, in some ways physically touch uh, carbon molecules uh, and cycle them in some way that's beneficial for the planet. Um, there's a couple of edge exceptions. There's marketplaces that facilitate um, uh, uh, that. Um, there are, you know, there's, there's different software. So there's not, there's not all that fit, always the physical connection, but the, the, the core concept is, how can we cycle carbon-based molecules in a way that is beneficial to, to the planet? Um, and that's sort of our umbrella. So who are we? Uh, you have me, you have Anjali and Kevin here day to day. Anjali is leading the effort. Kevin's uh, joint, pursuing a joint degree at uh, Duke on um, the business school and the Nicholas School and has been a ter terrific resource for this uh, 2021 market report. And he's our first uh, fellow, um, uh, official fellow uh, at, at CCN. And uh, I'm, I'm the co-founder, and um, we also have our colleagues at XPRIZE uh, who have been deep supporters, both financially and uh, bringing the whole resources of XPRIZE to bear on this effort. And now that we have the Carbon Removal Prize on top of the Carbon X Prize, we've got yet more data and yet more critical mass to try to really pr provide insights to the marketplace. To do that, though, we need, uh, we need great people. And so we're looking to build our team. So we're looking for a full-time analyst um, and we're, we're actively interviewing folks now. In fact, the, the formal deadline is actually, I think today or tomorrow, but uh, if anyone on this uh, feels like they've got a uh, you know, sort of data skill sets and a real passion for helping to, to grow our databases, automate them and get, uh, uh, analyze them and get value out to the, the marketplace so that, that that capital can flow and that commercial activity can increase, you know, please let us know. And we also um, looking for uh, a summer intern and uh, another data fellow for uh, for next year if you're um, at a you know an academic part of your career. So that's who we are, um, and we work with great partners. We don't do this alone, as I mentioned. XPRIZE and the New York Community Trust are our primary funders, but we also have relied from the beginning on uh, collaborating with others working in this space that bring uh, really important tools and perspectives to this challenge, whether it's a policy challenge. Uh, or technology, um, uh, you know, there's there's a whole set of folks that uh, whose missions really uh, nicely overlap what we're doing, and uh, our sources of data. And so what we do is we have data partnerships with a, a broad variety of groups, including IR Miners, who's been a, a great contributor from the beginning. Um, and we they share their data to us. We make sure it gets packet, you know, gets sliced and diced and gets up on our index and we give them credit. And then, uh, we, you know, we give them the, the views into what we're working on. So that, that's been critically important to our effort. And we're seeing a real growth in uh, our reach. So from the beginning, we've, uh, you know, we now our newsletter reaches almost 10,000 uh, um, uh, folks working in the space, and we've had uh, over 2,000 folks join us uh, since we've uh, um, started uh, CCN. And so we're really encouraged by the, you know, the evidence that we see from the marketplace of people getting there, using the data, asking questions, making suggestions about how we can improve it. So what is this data that I've talked about and why data? So you know, we do a number of things at CCN that uh, of trying to really convene the community, you know, create a sense of community, just like Air Miners does, has done so effectively. Um, we uh, we issue re reports as uh, we're gonna talk about today. You know, we've done a, a really intense effort to analyze the data uh, from 2021 and issue a formal report. And we've done a number of reports over the time. And that's all, you know, but our, our core sort of value proposition is really trying to be the best at um, understanding the evolving shape of this ecosystem, who the players are, uh, what they're doing, what solutions they're pursuing, what capital they need, what companies they're working with, what service providers and other supporting organizations are out there to, to, to support them. So we really feel that um, the data piece is, the, is sort of the tip of our spear. And so we have five indexes. We've got the innovator index, which is you know, really focused on startups. 
the deal hub, which is focused on startups looking for capital, uh, the capital index, which is, uh, you know, folks who are out there providing capital into this uh, circular carbon space, the corporate index, where we look at uh, large corporates that are I intersecting in any number of ways, whether they're doing R&D, they're uh, doing demo projects with startups, they're bringing their own solutions to the table, they're purchasing uh, solutions, um, any of those sort of material intersection points where we see a growing amount of corporate activity, we want to make that transparent and clear so those corporations can find great folks to do demos uh, with uh, startups, startups can find corporations to work with, etc. And then that catalyst index, which as you'll hear from Anjali, is really focused on these supporting organizations, all the way from the NGOs that have some you know, really important perspective on how to grow this space in a sustainable and equitable way, to um, you know, service providers like you know, attorneys who know uh, about permits that are needed for circular carbon solutions or engineering firms that um, can help uh, uh, help these companies scale. So that's a, just a look at across the indexes. And, you know, we've tried to uh, speak to these communities and say what data would be useful to you. And I think you'll see that in the information that Anjali and, and Kevin are going to share that, um, you know, we've tried to target uh, information in each of these uh, spaces that is, you know, really focused on driving collaboration, driving um, clarity about uh, what's out there and where they're going and what they need. I guess I'll just uh, uh, you know, wrap up here uh, before we get to the uh, 2021 report. And just, you know, I think we all know this, but just a quick uh, visual here, uh, courtesy of the Bipartisan Policy Center um, uh, on just some, maybe this is a little hard to read, but. You know, I think you all sense if you're if you're here at Air Miners and you're participating in this conversation, you're you're a part of this groundswell of activity and interest in the space, which is dramatically different. I mentioned that I uh, started on the journey with the Carbon X Prize in 2011, and it took some time to raise the capital. There just wasn't a lot of lot of there there yet. I mean, there was some, but not a lot. Um, and in the last couple of years, it's just ramped up dramatically, which is so obviously uh, gratifying to see. And, 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 and of course, critically important. We have, um, uh, you know, last September, uh, I did a, a presentation at a Director Capture Summit. I'm, as some of you may know, I'm very deeply involved in the Director Capture industry. I'm the president of Global Thermostat, uh, Director Capture Company. Um, so I was getting ready for my presentation and I was counting the months between September of 2021 and 2030. And it just so happened that it was exactly a hundred months, which really took me aback because that meant that every month uh, since then has been a percent of the time we have till 2030. And why 2020, 2030, excuse me? Um, you know, science tells us, the IPCC tells us that we need to really start scaling these solutions by 2030. It just like we needed to have uh, vaccines available to start distributing for the pandemic that we've just experienced, we need those solutions ready at a significant scale in less than 10 years. And every month now is less than, is over a percent. Every two weeks, which we can all think about, is a half of a percent of the time we have. This is urgent business. Fortunately, we're starting to see real activity. You might have, you heard the frontier announcement. Um, uh, you, you probably heard, uh, you know, companies like Climeworks, a peer company in the direct air capture space raised $650 million. The DOE has these hubs now, uh, uh, again, around the direct air capture space, but there's obviously a broad range of carbon removal um, efforts that are starting to get public support, sorry, public policy support, public uh, funding. Uh, voluntary corporate purchasing. So this is just really positive. It's all in the right direction, but we need to do more faster. And that's what we're all about at CCM. All right. Thanks for listening. Uh, really excited for this conversation. Let me pass it off to uh, Anjali and Kevin to give you a, um, a summary of what we found last year. Thanks, Nick. Just want to make sure everybody can hear me all right. Yeah. Gotcha. Great. Um, yeah, so I'm going to dive into what we found with the report. And again, as Nick just covered, this is, um, we did sort of stop gathering data at the end of last year. So we haven't included any of the information of what's happened in the first quarter, which has been incredible. Um, but this is a, a full recap of 2021. So the purpose of the report is for us to share our analysis in a way that gives our data more context and depth. 
Um, so we are obviously identifying current opportunities and challenges for the continued growth of this space and then making it free and available. We ultimately, like Nick has been talking about, aim to make um, catalyze more informed activity in this space. So we'll make, I want to make a brief note on our methodology. Um, so we compile our data from a broad combination of sources. Um, we do it from internal quantitative research, um, self-reported data by market participants in responses to the surveys that we send out um, uh, every quarter, and then, um, of course, a generous cross-sharing of market data by our global partners. So um, I will at one point drop a link in to share data if you have any um, that you would like to update from our index or if you would like to add or nominate other um, entities to be included, we would greatly appreciate it. It is the, 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 the depth of how we, how we do this. So um, our innovator landscape, I'm gonna cover that, innovators and deals right now, um, and then Kevin's gonna get into our uh, capital and corporate index. So uh, right now we're at a little over 400 startups uh, in over 38 different countries. So we analyze innovators um, through several criteria. We uh, obviously they need to be working in carbon tech or carbon removal in some way. And then also we look for companies that have at least engaged in the pilot phase of their project. They either have an active demo project going or they've secured seed or pre-seed funding. Um, so I'm gonna dive straight into give us a little bit of foundational um, information on our analysis of, of 2021. Um, we saw an interesting mix of startups in the space, uh, a fast growing almost 10% of the 400 uh, in our index started in 2021. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, an, an interesting point I always like to point out is that uh, almost a quarter of our the companies in our index have been around for over 10 years. So, um, you know, a significant, there's a significant cohort of more mature companies in this space. Um, I think probably more than, than most people probably think about uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, of all those companies, um, half, half of them, we have, we have revenue data on about 190 of them. Um, so a little under half. Um, and of those 56% are generating revenue. Um, and, uh, you know, additionally, 32% of them are generating over a million or more. So um, just some foundational information here on our analysis. Um, so we then look at different dimensions for um, commercial and te technological readiness. Um, you know, our technology, the technology in the space is maturing, but companies are still quite young. Um, Twenty percent of the companies that we report have, uh, are with the TRL level of six um, and above. Sorry, forty-two percent are early stage uh, with TRLs under six, um, and then fifty-six percent self-classify. Again, these are all self-reported um, as over as somewhat technologically advanced. And then, of course, nearly half of those. Um, so, twenty-seven percent of our index are showing at a TRL level of eight or nine, and we would classify as highly um, technologically advanced. Um, and then, yes, again, so to sort of match that, we are looking at the commercial stages um, of, of the companies in the index, and we see that over 77% are actively commercializing, um, with about 21% of them still in R&D phase. So, so the takeaway here is, is simply that the industry is nearing readiness for increased deployment. Um, we're sort of slowly moving up that, that curve. And then we're going to get into very, very briefly the total amount of capital raised by innovators. And this is what we track over the last three years. Um, total, we've tracked over, up to $3.1 billion to date um, in self-reported amount of capital raised by innovators. Um, we saw $816 million alone in uh, 2021. Um, and then that's by 101 companies. And so we did take that data and do a little bit more of a deeper dive. And we saw um, that in there, we saw more investment per company than in any of the previous years. So we saw a 307% increase in investment per company than in uh, previous years, which we felt was very positive. So then we're going to get into our deal hub, which is, um, you know, as Nicholas was talking about, designed specifically to address the needs of capital providers 
um, and feature investor relevant information about live investment opportunities. Um, we have a, a almost 250 investor members which are accredited, accredited investors that have access to the deals. And then um, innovators who are approved to be in our index are then able to list their deals on our deal hub. We saw um, up, of, up to 110 deals this year, or last year, apologies. Um, and yeah, let's see, let's get into this here. Um, so our first, our first takeaway at this is we're gonna look at what was reported to be previous sources of capital um, versus types of capital that was sought. So um, we see a correlation in that angel and family offices uh, represent the most common funding type, both in previous sources of capital and in types of capital sought. And that trend is consistent with the last few years of our data. Um, so we've analyzed it in, in 2019 and 2020, and that trend is quite, um, quite similar. Um, institutional investors, um, as far as previous reported previous sources of capital, institutional investors only increased uh, by six percent from from last year. Um, so, not, we, you know, it's safe to say that non-institutional capital is still a leading source of capital for circular carbon innovators. Um, and then, additionally, we added in a new category last year, which was uh, um, founder funding, and we saw that uh, up to eleven percent um, of our um, of our deals and, and companies that have, have raised capital comes from founder funding, which you know does indicate that there's perhaps a, a increase in confidence in founders investing their own capital in this space. Um, also, a, a positive sign of, of growth in the space. Um, and then, as far as capital sought, um, you know, like I said, family office, uh, family office, and angel investors combined are the most sought after type of capital. Um, with corporate strategic and venture capital, uh, you know, close behind strong preference for innovators seeking funding. Um, so there is one discrepancy I do want to point out here, um, and we'll talk about a little bit more when we get into the catalyst index. But um, we see, you know, there is when you look at the government funding um, uh, buckets here, you see that there, you know, we see that that nearly thirty percent of our Founders have raised capital from um, government sources, but only 12% of companies are actively seeking um, government funding. And hopefully, you know, we'll see that gap start to close this year um, in the wake of historic government funding opportunities that have, you know, recently been announced. So then, getting into um, valuations, we saw a, a massive increase in valuations from 2020 to 2021 by five the, to the tune of 5.4 billion dollars. Uh, so Again, I'll caveat that by saying it's self-reported pre-money valuations um, uh, totaling over 6.9 billion um, in 2021. Um, and it's obvious, and I think also likely underrepresented given some missing data points that we have in, you know, in, in, in our indexes. Um, this obviously, again, strongly suggests increased general interest in the sector. Um, and we see 60% reporting a valuation of $20 million and under, and 40% are reporting a valuation of over $20 million. In this last slide here, um, of the 110 uh, deals we looked at last year, that was seeking 816 million in capital sought. Um, that's roughly a quarter of our index seeking, uh, seeking deals. Um, and the investment ranges are um, 75% of these are roughly in early investment stages, but the, um, let's see here. I mean, basically there's a, a, a broad range of opportunities here. As you can see a quite even distribution of um, deal, round sizes available um, on our deal hub. So, you know, there's a broad range of opportunities for any kind of investor that's interested in playing in the space. So with that, I think we're gonna move on to the capital index and Kevin is going to take it from here. Thanks, Anjali. Uh, so the capital index, what we were talking about before was, um, you know, innovators listing their deals um, on, on our deal hub. Um, now we're going to get into the real perspective of uh, the capital providers. Um, 159 firms uh, across the globe and then over 200 billion in assets under management represented across those firms. 
And I think it's notable um, the inclusion of some private equity firms uh, this year, like Generate Capital and TPG's Rise Fund, um, really uh, increasing the, the total assets under management that are investing and interested in investing in this industry. Um, a lot of the data is coming from investor surveys uh, that will then fill the gap in from internal research or, or just purely internal research or, or vice versa. The first thing to point out is just the increase in uh, uh, moving from you know just over a third of uh, funders having actually deployed capital into the industry um, to this year over half ha have done so, um, and that uh, increase is also represented by almost a doubling of the total uh, amount of reported investment that these uh, capital providers have made. I'm going from 131 million in total investments last year. Uh, I, at the point of last year um, to over 244 million uh, now. We also saw the biggest year over year percentage increase uh, coming from government and, and project finance. I think that is both inclusion of those categories uh, this year, as well as just uh, an indicator that uh, innovators are, you know, building their pilot projects and they, they need to start uh, having project finance vehicles in order to do so. And that money is starting to flow into the industry. Uh, now, I, I imagine these numbers will be even more significant growth uh, as we look at the 2022 and what's happened over, over the last quarter. So here, uh, it's kind of a, a snapshot, I would say, of, of, of the industry, of where we're at. So um, vast majority of, of preferred investment is coming from, from corporate equity, uh, or that's the preferred investment vehicle. Um, but what we'll notice when comparing it to last year's uh, trends, uh, last year investment types, is the significant increase in corporate equity uh, being the preferred investment vehicle, and that coming uh, at the cost of convertible debt. And then when you compare that to the target check size over here, the bulk being between one and, and, and 25 million, you, you start to get a, a view that this industry, it's, it's early, um, but capital providers are starting to recognize that it's legitimate. OK, that that uh, they're, they're willing to offer equity investments, that the growth is going to come um, and then that series A, you know, one to twenty five million is kind of the, the median uh, uh, stage at which the investments are, are coming through. But also that, you know, a third of the capital providers here, almost a third are, are looking to invest over 10 million per, per investment. So th th there is some opportunity for larger uh, check sizes as well. Now. We look at the last two slides, we're kind of showing investors recognizing the legitimacy of the industry. Um, these, uh, this slide may indicate that it's not the traditional venture capital space that we've seen uh, in, in software. Uh, this year, more investors are, are looking at longer term investments, looking at over a seven year time horizon. Uh, more investors are weighing impact over uh, over returns that are that are deploying of those that are deploying uh, capital in the industry uh, more are, are weighing e impact and returns equally more are willing to accept lower returns or higher risk in exchange for impact and then less are only focused on returns so not not necessarily the traditional VC landscape that, uh, that we've seen uh, in the past in the early 2000s um, this also could be an indicator that uh, innovators have a bit more leverage here, that they're willing to select those who are interested in impact and that are uh, focused on a more patient, on a longer time horizon for, for their investments. And, and those are the ones that uh, are the investments that are being made and, and being accepted by innovators. So a bit of a mismatch between the stage that funders are, are typically deploying uh, funds and uh, where innovators are looking for funds. So this is sort of a cross-section across uh, two of our in, in indices. Um, standard distribution of where capital providers are, are deploying capital, uh, Series A, C, a uh, few less, but still some in the later growth stages. Uh, now, the vast majority of those in our uh, index are more seed Series A. Uh, so this could be an indicator of a few different things. Uh, could be that there's a gap in our index, uh, and we're, we really do have a weight towards the, these early seed stage uh, businesses. Um, I think maybe more likely, it's an indicator of the state of the industry. Uh, it's it's younger, more nascent industry. Uh, we really are at sort of the seed and Series A stage of it, 
and uh, expect over time we'll see more Series B, C, and, and later growth stage uh, investment opportunities available. Uh, another intersection uh, point between the capital providers and uh, the revenue range. Pretty aligned here, you know, uh, there's not necessarily an expectation from uh, those that are funding the industry that you have defined revenue and, and really um, have shown that you're able to attract customers at this point. Uh, and that matches, you know, the stage of innovators typically, you know, the majority being pre-revenue or, or less than a million dollars um, per year. And it, it's, 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 there's, there's a match here. Um, there's no need to, uh, to sacrifice your long-term prosperity as, as a startup for, for short-term investment gains. Cause there, there's an understanding, it seems that capital providers are, are willing to meet you um, where you're at and willing to meet the industry where it's at. All right, moving on to, uh, to the corporate landscape. So I, I think this is huge. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this index. Uh, it's it's uh, mostly internal research, but it's it's just so vital that corporates are engaged and really fueling this industry for it to grow at the, state, at the pace it, it needs to. Um, the balance sheets are, are needed from there. The expertise are needed from the from these entities in order to, to really establish the market for it. We, we orient our, our research around five intersection points. Um, our is the corporation involved in research and their own, own uh, building their own technologies to, to enter the market, um, investing in others or in projects, um, hosting projects uh, at the locations they control, or are they purchasing either um, carbon dioxide removal or carbon dioxide or, or uh, derived, carbon derived entities? Um, really, any kind of purchasing or sales in that space uh, is where uh, we focus. Um, sort of the five areas in which they can engage the industry. Uh, 80 corporations, over 5 trillion in revenue, and, and notably representing over 6 billion uh, tons of uh, carbon emissions per year. So on the left side, uh, it's clear that uh, the most common uh, form of engagement is, is through research and development, um, followed by investment and other forms. But what's notable is looking at just the 2021 editions, um, this uh, graph wouldn't match it. it. It would be entirely different distribution. Um, new additions into the index were more focused on investment and, and purchasing of carbon dioxide removal or, or of some sort of circular carbon um, products. In fact, about uh, two thirds of those new ones were, were engaged in purchasing or investment and then only a third were engaged in research and development. So perhaps an indication that uh, these corporations are using investment more frequently as a vehicle um, to handle the energy transition and, and to um, de-risk this energy transition as opposed to their own internal research and development, looking to innovators to, to innovate and then for them to invest in that. Uh, another uh, sort of interesting point we were able to, to derive uh, from, from our data was looking at just those entities who were hosting projects and where they sit on the emissions spectrum. Um, I, I think it'd be no surprise here to point out that the heavy emitters are the ones who are looking to deploy uh, negative emissions technologies and they're looking to host them on their sites. Um, so only less than a third of index is a project host, but that among that third, it represents over uh, about 60% of um, the overall emissions from the, from the corporations in the index. All right. Finally, uh, the you know level of interest in in carbon removal and carbon removal here. Uh, more and more, we're, we're seeing uh, a recognition that carbon removal is kind of the future. Uh, that this is uh, where um, that this may be become the standard for for what. Uh, the industry needs to uh, uh, needs to pursue, and that's why those who are investing in it are are seeing it as a core focus, secondary focus, or, or one of the areas that they're really concentrating their investment in from a corporate development standpoint. And there's a lot more emphasis on um, more permanent solutions. You know, eighty percent of those who are are making circular carbon investments uh, are focused on more. Uh, geologic storage permanent solutions, um, less so on uh, reforestation and uh, other 
perhaps not non-permanent solutions. And on that note, I will pass it over to Anjali to wrap up with our Catalyst Index. Thanks, Kevin. Um, okay, so our Catalyst Index does catalog the emerging market needed, um, you know, that needs a broad array of support. So, um, you know, there's accelerators, um, industry associations, service providers like air miners, um, like Carbon Plan and and several others. We, we, catalog, we catalog 101 right now in nine different countries, providing 23 different services in this space. So the organizational types, there's a growing diversity in the catalyst organizational types we see this year. Uh, both conveners and platforms being the most common, um, and, and, and that sort of took over last year's leader, which was an in, the NGO space. Um, service providers are the second highest, um, and perhaps this is evidence of the growing business opportunities uh, to service um, those innovators and, and ideas in the circular carbon economy. Uh, and we also saw significant growth in accelerators and think tanks. Um, and then circling back around on the point about um, government funding, um, you know, in order to understand um, what these organizations do, who their core target target audiences are, um, we we saw 23 additions of policy focused organizations added in uh, 2021, greatly outweighing um, you know data providers and uh, monitoring, reporting, and consulting uh, in the space. And I think that's both a reflection and possibly possibly a driver of increased global policy activity around circular carbon activities. Um, and again, our target, target customers are pretty widely distributed um, between corporates, innovators, governments, and capital providers. So that is the wrap up of our market report trends. Um, I hope it was useful to everyone. Um, what can you do next? You can access the entire 80 page report at circularcarbon.org. Um, you can also let us know how you use it. Uh, feedback is very important to us right now as we develop um, as an organization. Um, we, want, we want it to be useful to the marketplace and we would love to know if you use it in your research or to develop a thesis. Please just shoot us a note at, at community um, at circularcarbon.org and let us know. Um, and then of course, if you're not in our database or you've never heard of us before, please go to our website and um, add your data. Uh, it doesn't take too terribly long um, and it is very helpful um, for the overall industry. So, oh, and then of course, uh, just a quick plug again, we are hiring. Uh, today is the, I think the final day for applicants for an analyst, um, for a fellow for next year, starting in September and a summer intern. If you know anyone, um, please, um, please shoot them our way um, and community at circularcarbon.org. Um, before Jason opens up the floor, I will say we don't know this data. We have, have it memorized, um, so please lower your expectations <laughs> with your questions. Um, and with that, uh, Jason, take it away. Hey there. Thanks, Anjali, Kevin, and Nicholas. This is great. Um, we had a question from Christine Parrish. I think, Kevin, you might have answered it in the chat, but Christine, just maybe just ask your question and we'd love to hear. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested because we've seen it in in funds like Breakthrough Energy that have a strong preference for for DAC technologies. Um, but as we're looking to actually start deploying a lot of these large scale carbon capture, if people who are purchasing offsets kind of um, have a strong preference for DAC versus point source, as long as it's both going to geologic storage, do you see them having a preference or is the preference really about the permanent carbon storage? I can take that unless, uh, Nicholas, you have anything to add here. Uh, I would say among those who are involved in, in offsetting have indicated that they're, they're purchasing offsets. Um, it, it's heavily weighted towards permanent carbon removal, uh, with the caveat being uh, the supply may not meet the demand there. Uh, and so they're having to, you know, in written language, it's, it's very much permanent solution. Um, but in, in reality of what they're purchasing, it, it may not all be available for them. Yeah, I would just, thanks, Kevin. I would just add, I, I think that um, 
it is still the wild west out there and carbon removal is coming online in various forms from various sources. I do think there has been uh, an opening of the spigot in just the last few years that is quite remarkable in terms of the new solution pathways across technological, biological, geological, and oceanic um, solutions. And so you're seeing people trying new things. Um, and so I think, you know, it, there probably has been a, a move away uh, uh, from, you know, flue gas capture, sequestration a little bit, just because it was one of the only games in town on the technological side, along with, you know, forestry and, and some other uh, agricultural stuff. So there's just more choice now. Um, uh, I'm biased. I'm a, a direct air capture guy. Uh, um, we're definitely seeing interest increase there. And that interest didn't even exist a couple years ago because neither did direct air capture. Hope that addresses your question. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Feel free to any, for anyone else to put the, your questions in the chat and we'll have you uh, unmute and ask. I actually have a, a you know, bit of a follow up. Again, when we say permanent, I mean, uh, it, it's not like, you know, per, you know, 100%, you know, 100% permanent versus 100% impermanent. I mean, there's, there's, there's a spectrum here. Do you have any sense of like the number of years of permanence uh, that people refer to? Well, uh, Anjali, I'm sure you have an insight there. Um, I, I, I hear very quickly, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk uh, across the spectrum. I think if you, if you look at climate science, it'll tell you several centuries to sort of a thousand years to, for, for um, a given carbon molecule or CO2 molecule to work its way naturally outside of the atmosphere, you know, to degrade whatever, what have you, or be absorbed. So, you know, centuries to a thousand years is sort of on the, what the climate science tells us and someone on this call might know more precisely than, than I just said, but certainly you're seeing, uh, um, you can see climate benefits in terms of displacing uh, virgin forms of fossil carbon um, that are much, you know, much shorter, right? You know, all the way from the example of sort of bubbles, you know, in, in, in carbonation that's not sourced from fossil sources, but sort of sourced from the atmosphere. It's a very short cycling time. Um, uh, is it beneficial to the, uh, you know, to the climate fight? Um, I, I would argue, yes. Is it substantial? May, probably not. But is it better than digging up new fossil fuels? Um, but on the offset side, I think you're seeing a migration to 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 the you know deeper permanence, but it's still a big spectrum. Anjali, what do you what do you think? I would just add to that 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 while permanence is something that I think this community specifically needs to be highly focused on and almost laser focused on, it's also just only one of several criteria that that purchasers look at. Um, and right now, it's every I think every company is coming up with their own strategy and their own philosophy um, and guiding principles to what that looks like and how they're going to participate. Um, we typically, I think, are just seeing more portfolio based purchases um, that include some removals, but um, it really does it, it. The nature of it bleeds into investments and in, in R&D in, in as well. So, you know, it's just highly dynamic right now. Um, and I would just say that permanence, while it is like it should be the goal um, from an innovator standpoint, it's also just only one of one of many uh, dimensions that, that purchasers look at. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, Mitko, a question. If, if Hello. You ask. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Um, great. So my question is about uh, what is their time horizon for companies which are purchasing carbon removals, either as a part of portfolio or directly? Is it only in the first like one, two years or are they looking to do offtake agreements that are more like four or five years ahead or even further? Thank you. I can take Anecdot that. Uh, go, ahead. go ahead, Nicholas. No, go ahead, Kevin. I was going to say anecdotally, uh, in the last week or so, I was looking through the, uh, the Stripe purchases and um, the actual language in their agreements from 2021, I believe, stipulated delivery by the end of 2024. Um, I, I haven't, I don't have a reference here for like Shopify and, and Microsoft's or other removal agreements, but they were at least um, okay with a two year plus uh, time horizon. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you're starting to see for advanced, advanced market purchases for multi-year offtakes. Um, so to provide, you know, maybe five or even 10 years of certainty around the purchasing, it's still at low volumes. Um, certainly 
from a project finance perspective, you're, you, you know, uh, investors are going to want to see those 10, 20, 30 year type of uh, trajectories uh, to be able to finance a project. Um, so, uh, and that would obviously be good news for the providers of the solutions too, because then they have that, again, that certainty of the, of the revenue stream. Um, so we're not quite there yet. I mean, there are some carbon removal projects that, you know, do have those multi-decadal timeframes, but we're not quite there yet. It's, it's as Anjali said, it's still early days and, and I, I do see it creeping up, uh, which is good. Um, but there's also just a desire to get anything out there to help uh, these solutions come down their cost curve. Okay, great. Um, had a question come in from Thomas Morgan. Thomas, uh, Timo, are you able to unmute and ask or? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, go for it. Hey everybody, uh, great presentation, uh, awesome data and the way it was displayed, uh, very in depth. Uh, just curious on, you know, I have to ask this question, Web3, blockchain, crypto, um, you know, I, to me, it's the elephant in the room. Uh, you know, just some quick stats like near protocol, which is a blockchain, you know, $8.2 billion market cap. Uh, Cello uh, wants to put carbon in their reserve. That's a $1 billion market cap. I mean, these are, these are real demand sources. Love it or hate it. Uh, you think it's fake money. I mean, that, that right there is $10 billion of potential demand. Um, I mean, I know no, not all of it would go to carbon removal, but the, this is, you know, real uh, money that can be thrown at this. Um, you know, and then if you add in, you know, love it or hate it again, Klima or Toucan, uh, that's another 50, 60, that's another $120 million of market cap in demand. And that, that those are, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what's happening in blockchain and Web3 and crypto. So just wondering if that uh, those stats weren't uh, asked, right? Or if people didn't have an option to put those in or, um, or maybe just people didn't respond. Maybe people aren't doing it in this world. So that's my question, thank you. Uh, if no, I know we didn't focus on that. Yeah, we don't have much data in that space, but I, uh, you've got my head spinning on how we can incorporate this. You know, uh, it, it's so much activity there. And uh, that's the, I, I think an example of the ways in which we're looking to expand the data set to these, be more encompassing of the different puzzle pieces here that are gonna be important for scaling uh, circular carbon. Um, and so welcome your and others, <coughs> excuse me, input on what we should be covering and suggestions and referrals right on our website at circularcarbon.org. There's the opportunity to nominate, <coughs> excuse me, solutions. So I encourage you to do that. I'm going to go cough now. And uh, shameless plug number one coming up right now. Um, for those of us who are in Air Miners uh, Slack right now, uh, on Friday at uh, 10 a.m., we're actually having a conversation within Airminers, a uh, live audio-only uh, Slack huddle event, kind of like Clubhouse for uh, for uh, for Slack, uh, about carbon and crypto. So, uh, see, hope to see you there. Um, question from Jose Poro, please, Jose. Hi. Yeah, I'll, I'll admit my. Um question is a bit biased uh, because I, I am an innovative carbon reduction, but I do very much believe in carbon removal space. And, and that's why I'm part of air miners. I think it's something that definitely needs to happen. But I guess a, the question that I have is um, what, what is the benefit? And, and I, I hear an answer a lot, but I don't know that it's the right answer. So I'm just curious what um, uh, you folks in the panel think about it. And the question is, what is the benefit of being so uh, selective in the type of technology that is being offered? Because if it still results in less CO2 in the atmosphere, it's still innovative, it's not being done and it needs to be done. Uh, why does it matter whether it's carbon removal or carbon reduction? Well, oh, for the so indexes, curious. it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, okay. Just to be clear, um, so we encompass um, mitigation and uh, removal 
um, in the index. So, so there's carbon tech solutions in there that aren't permanent removals that, uh, but are climate beneficial. Now we can have a broader debate around, you know, how to, how to value mitigation versus removal and all that sort of stuff. The, but in our view, for the purpose of the index, uh, we are tracking uh, across that space in, a, in, in the circular carbon context, right? We're not tracking solar developers or solar solutions or wind or things like that. Um, but in the, sol in the carbon space, we are tracking um, solutions that are, that are, that are purely uh, um, mitigation. Some of them could be removal, you know, direct air capture to uh, geologic sequestration is removal. Direct air capture to e-fuels is mitigation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. I, I, I guess I, I was misunderstanding the, the definitions a little bit, but um, that helps to know. That's good to know. And I think I guess the other fear that I'm having, like especially like with the frontier announcement, what what uh, Stripe and Shopify have been doing, uh, just they seem to be like hyper focused on carbon removal. Uh, I just feel like it's kind of creating a trend where if you're not technically carbon removal, people are not going to be interested. And, and the answer is always, well, we're, we're focusing so much on carbon removal because uh, carbon reduction alone won't solve the answer. But you can say the exact same about carbon removal. Carbon removal alone won't solve the problem. So um, yeah, I'm just kind of uh, seeing, starting to see that trend. But it's good to hear that you guys kind of are a bit more holistic in that way. Great, okay, thanks for your question. Great, uh, Jamie Rogers, feel free to unmute yourself. Hey there, uh, and apologies for any background noise on a train. Uh, great presentation, um, uh, really helpful. The um, question I had was really around sort of the, the assessment that needs to be done around offsets uh, and removals. Um, from kind of you know a standardization standpoint, and you know, and and driving at kind of you know an understanding of pricing, given that we don't have a carbon, <clears throat> you know, global carbon market, uh, and everything is voluntary. And you know, when you look at the various sources, you'll see things priced you know at anywhere from ten dollars a ton to six hundred. And again, there's there's not a lot of clarity in why. And us, you know, who are in in the weeds know why because we understand each of these technologies and pathways and what the differences are between an offset and and removal of a ton or even a circular ton you know um so just want to know sort of where where you think that standardization can best occur um whether it's through third part you know sort of governments third party standard setting organizations companies uh you know offering the products where, where does all that happen Anjali you want to take that one Um, I just want to clarify what that question was, if you could. Yeah, I think what ja uh, Jamie's really asking is um, how do we stand, you know, wh where can we best start to standardize uh, uh, the different types of offsets and how they're, you know, how they're assessed and how they're priced, how to value them? I mean, that's the golden question, isn't it? I mean, I think everyone, it's on everyone's mind. And it's certainly something that I think as we continue to evolve our index to analyze points like that, we can we can certainly try to, I mean, there's, there is, I think from Jason's, um, I mean, everyone has got a question around offsets and the future of offsets. Um, so, I mean, I don't think we're really well poised. Our data isn't directly focused on that. I think we might have one or two questions that focus on that. Um, you know, I just don't think we we personally have the data to speak to that from a, a confidence. Yeah, I, I would just I agree. It's, it is the golden question. And there are, as you might know, there's a number of global efforts underway to uh, to look at that in depth and really establish the, you know, the market frameworks to enable the growth of the offset market, because it is, a, it, it you know, there are a number of different standards out there, but they were uh, established in a slightly different era with less solution pathways. And now that the solution pathways are proliferating, you know, it's sort of how do you compare uh, growing a tree in you know Sumatra to uh, putting a, a 
you know, of soil carbon in Kansas. You know, it's 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 very um, it's very tough to think about, uh, um, and but yet we need to because you know there are different levels of of, of measurability of permanence of um, land requirements of energy requirements. There's all these different factors, and I, I ultimately think uh, you know we've learned how to price um, different commodities, different um, different uh, assets in our system at a big scale before. And we're just sort of in the early to middle stages here of doing this. We'll figure it out. But right now it does seem it's, 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 it's quite unclear to everyone. Um, I think you're gonna find that um, as much as I'm a tree hugger um, and I am, uh, you know, a $10 forestry credit uh, is a different value proposition than a, a thousand year or 10,000 or 100,000 year C, uh, carbon uh, geologic sequestration. It's just a different product. It's not better or worse. You're getting different things and the market will value them differently uh, for different purposes. Yeah, and to say nothing of biochar, which is kind of is in, in, the, in the middle, in the middle. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Thanks panel, thank you everyone for your time and attention and all the great questions that came up. Uh, Anjali just shared a link to circular carbon uh, to update and nominate data. I just shared a link, we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, so I shared a link to the survey uh, for you to answer what you liked, what you didn't like. That's the best way that we can improve our future events for you, our audience. Uh, additionally, I'm happy to announce that two weeks from today, two weeks from today on May 18th, two weeks from today on May 18th, May 18th, we're going to have a air miners event focused on some of our air miners who recently won the X Prize Milestone Awards. Um, so we can feature some of the uh, companies that are part of our community uh, in a public event uh, that uh, have uh, achieved the uh, distinction of winning the milestone prize announced on Earth Day a couple of weeks ago. So should be a fun event uh, and hope to see you there. Um, that's the conclusion of our presentation today. Um, once again, thank you everyone. I'm going to stop the recording shortly and we're going to stick for, around for a little while for some post-event networking if people want to uh, share their thoughts and insights and get to know each other a little bit better. So once again, thank you, and we'll be on for another event in two weeks' time.